All right, so uh, the next person who I'm introducing is uh, Dr. Richard Favell, who is a, a, a Yale local uh, speaker, but he's, his reputation is really, uh, really precedes him. He's known worldwide as a, as a really an expert in, in genetic modeling of, of, of immuno immunological problems. And that includes some work that he's been doing in cancer uh, that he'll be telling us about today. So he's uh, a Sterling Professor of Immunobiology here at the School of Medicine, and he'll be telling us today about studying immune, human cancer in humanized mice. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's uh, great to have this uh, effort coming to fruition here, and uh, it's such a wonderful week to do it in. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, as has been mentioned multiple times, one of the real needs uh, uh, to help these very important studies is, is approaches that can lead to some kind of causality connections in order to guide uh, what we want to do with, uh, with therapies in, in this, these diseases. And so around 2005, we decided to, to try and develop um, uh, humanized mouse systems in which you could study that. And the basic concept was that if you could put uh, a, a human cancer into a, a system which is an in vivo system in a relatively um, physiologic context, in other words, that the other cells that were present were to a great degree human as well, that, that you could study this process and that the other cells, at least if they're mouse cells, were, were doing things rather similar to what human cells might do. And that was the basic concept. And so uh, we teamed up with Regeneron uh, uh, who had developed some very uh, high throughput um, at that time uh, methods for changing DNA and, in order to make animals that would allow us to do this. And um, at that point, I have to, to, I guess, do I advance with this thing? Probably, right? Let's try that. Yeah, now, so this is not a new idea. Uh, and many people had, had done this before, but there were clearly, clearly uh, problems with, the, with these methodologies. And this thing maybe work? Any of these worked? Anybody pre previous speakers notice? <laughs> this one? So dead? Dim. That one's dim. Ah, third one. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Here we go. That's good. All right. Uh, okay. So you can see that uh, this is, tells you the kinds of cells. This is over, over the uh, the last several years. There are multiple ways of doing this, but but despite the, the improvements, and there were significant improvements, it's pretty obvious that these are all pretty different for what people look like. And, and so therefore something needed to, to be done. And, and obviously we haven't, we haven't got there, but we have been able to make some improvements that have been helpful. Um, and in particular for the subject we're talking about today, the, the tumor microenvironment is relevant. And um, the, the fact that uh, the, uh, the relationship of tumor cells with the stromal cells, uh, and particularly cells of the immune system, whereby you, of course, also you have lymphocytes, but you also have a, a pretty major myeloid population, which is suspected of, play, of playing a pretty big role. And that's been shown pretty nicely in murine uh, cancer models and therefore was likely to be relevant in humans. So this was a particular focus uh, early on in our studies, which is to get good myeloid populations. So what are humanized mice? Well, uh, there are various ways to do this, but we took a method that had been developed by Marcus Manns and collaborated with Marcus at the time it uses neonatal, uh, or perinatal, I should say, injection of human uh, progenitor cells, CD34 cells, into the, into the uh, uh, newborn mouse's uh, liver, which at that time was a hematopoietic organ. And uh, if you do that, then the cells will go on to develop into populations as the mouse uh, gets older. Uh, but we recognized the, that there was a major problem because to expect all these human cells to develop in a mouse was, was pretty ambitious given that many of the factors that actually regulate hematopoiesis are pretty divergent in evolution. Red are the divergent ones. And this led us to a very simple uh, concept, which is let's take the ones that matter and just replace the mouse ones with human. And we did that by, uh, as I said, in collaboration with the guys at Regeneron. And uh, uh, what we did is essentially to knock into the mouse allele a human uh, a gene. Uh, rendering the human gene susceptible to the expression uh, of the mouse microenvironment, the chromosomal microenvironment. And the goal was to have, have the cytokines made in the right place at the right time in the right amount. And that has worked pretty well with many cases. 
uh, as, as always in life, not everything, but it's been pretty useful. And uh, making a, no, a long story short, we, uh, these, these are the things that we knocked in uh, in that first era. And so we combined these, uh, having shown initially that they had modular effects. So the modular effects were things like MCSF or CSF1 gives good myeloid cells, GMCSF gives nice al alveolar macrophages, et cetera, et cetera. S so this modular effect could be improved upon by com combination. And so that's what we did. And um, the mouse that we obtained, which, which uh, we, we called, well, actually one of my postdocs called Mr. G, which is... Uh, very acute name, obviously, and I have to thank him for that. It was not my idea at all. And anyway, it basically combines these properties. Uh, immunosuppression. These genes take out mouse TB and NK cells, so you don't attack the human cells, at least from an immune perspective. Uh, phagocytic tolerance. Phagocytes will destroy foreign cells if they don't recognize the CD47 syrup alpha axis. And so we fixed that to a degree by replacing the human uh, syrup alpha and taking out the mouse, initially with the transgene and more recently with the knock-in. And then uh, this provides that don't eat me signal. And this was to give the myeloid cell development I just mentioned. And then we compared things to see does this really help, and I'll quickly summarize that uh, in, from some uh, uh, published data which are a few years old now. And this is a variety of uh, mice. Each dot is a mouse, and the big picture, if you go work, look at the right-hand side basically, is these various early models like RAG gamma or the NSG, the commercially uh, kind of the gold standard commercial model because you can buy them. Uh, these are not as good as these improved animals. And in particular, the reason for this is, is to do with myeloid cells. And you can see here, this is an, the NSG mouse. It, it doesn't have much in the way of myeloid composition. Not surprisingly, it lacks the, the appropriate factors. And even the one that has been generated up by adding transgenes to this does not really recapitulate this, this human system as well as this system here. And so this was not perfect. Uh, but it was, it was getting us somewhere. This is the Mr. G system. Uh, red is myeloid uh, uh, compared here to here. The reason, actually, one of the reasons there in his blood that this is not as good as that is there's not many neutrophils, and we're working on improving that. You get tissue macrophages. This is kind of important, of course, because when we get to tumors, tumors are a variant of an aberrant tissue, and it has its own macrophages. Um, and so this seems to work pretty well in most places that we've looked. Um, you get monocytes. That's also important because monocytes are going to infiltrate um, tumors as they develop and become local macrophages. And they, this is human blood. Uh, you get these three classes. And actually, you get these three classes in this Mr. G mouse, uh, whereas you don't really in, in the NSG system. And this gave us also an improvement there. And uh, we looked at the function of these, of these systems and actually uh, for example, one can study human monocyte uh, 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 differentiation by transferring human monocytes into these mice, as we showed in collaboration with a, a group from London. Um, these uh, myeloid cells do stuff. If, if you, I'm not going to get into detail, but if you uh, infect uh, one of these humanized mice with listeria, which is, a, of course, a, a pathogen of people in, in, in immunodeficiency, you get a good innate immune response. This is human IL-6. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the commercial mouse, you don't get much because it, it's a myeloid cell product. Uh, now, why is this all working? Uh, well, we knocked in these genes, and, and, and what they're doing is they're expressing in, in mesenchymal stromal cells. And this uh, is an experiment done by Yan Bin in uh, Stephanie Helene's lab, and shows that if you look at uh, these mice, the, the, these factors that we popped in here are actually uh, being expressed in the microenvironment, and that's what's... Uh, leading them to be useful, and that's presumably the way in which this is all working. So this got us to this stage here. Um, some synergy of these cytokines, permissive for hum human hematopoiesis, definitely not perfect, obviously, but we do get some myeloid development and functional immune responses against uh, uh, pathogens. Uh, th another useful feature is you can get this, this, this secondary effect of of having myeloid cells, because myeloid cells make things that other cells use. And one example is IL-15, which is a myeloid product, and, and actually is required for human NK cells. Human NK cells are not normally in these humanized mouse systems. And sure enough, if you look, um, these, these Mr. G mice make IL-15, they make IL-15 receptor, and uh, they particularly come, this particular actually is coming from these monocytes of this class, and uh, as you can see here, 
And that is reflected actually in getting, getting reasonably good human NK cells. And this is, a, for example, liver. This is the NK uh, plot. That's the NSG system, which lacks them for the reasons we discussed. But these mice have a pretty good NK system. And they actually work. They will kill uh, and behave like NK cells. I won't belabor that point in such a short talk. So that's the second thing that, get, that you get. You get the primary and secondary effects of, uh, of this, this system. We've developed a, a, a second system. I'll, I'll very quickly go over this. Uh, one of the points about the IL-15 is it's made by two environments. One environment is the, uh, the myeloid environment, monocytes I just explained, but there's a second source which is stromal. And so we miss that stromal source. And so uh, uh, Dietmar and Liang in, in the lab collaborated with Kagan Gura, Kagan from uh, Regeneron, uh, sorry, no picture. But, uh, um, and we made, uh, an, in collaboration with Re Regeneron, our humanized IL-15 allele, combined that with a humanized SERP alpha allele on a simpler mouse system, and then validated it in the following way. And basically, um, what this does is to uh, work very nicely. It, it expresses in, in the stromal cells of these various environments, as you would, as you would hope, uh, and, and gives reasonably uh, physiologic levels. Um, if you look in, in, in the environments where this, this, um, this factor is being made, particularly in, in the intestine, in fact, you end up getting things that you don't normally find in these humanized mice. So human into epithelial lymphocytes, very important in coastal immunity, are actually re reconstituted by this. So this animal is useful for, by that property. And for that reason, we're combining that gene into our Mr. G system. And you can see these are the cells. This is showing the SRG15 having these IELs, for example, published last year. Um, this tells us also that these IELs look like they're the right thing. They express tissue resident markers. Uh, these cells live in that environment because they have properties which keep them there where they play a role in, in barrier, uh, basically surveillance. Um, as I said, these mice make NK cells. They make them in multiple tissues. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through the development uh, business too much. But the question is, are, the, are, the, are these NK cells also functional? And there are many good markers that one can use for NK function. And, and uh, particularly the C56, CD56 dim property, which we don't need to go into too much detail. But these, this is the population which is found in human, and, that, and as you can see, it's nicely present in this SRG15 mice. So uh, for those reasons, and by doing CITOF, which you heard about recently uh, in the earlier talk, we can, we, we can use these parameters to tell ourselves that at least these cells look superficially rather like human NK cells, making us feel you know, relatively confident that they're useful. This is kind of a summary of that, that property compare, comparing this, this very uh, non-quantitative look. OK, so that's, that's that part. Uh, the, uh, the cells work in killing assays. This is just a, 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 a testing in, a, 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 an ability of the NK cells to kill uh, tumor cells. And actually, this can be useful to, to study, study drug action. Uh, rituximab is, of course, used in therapy of, 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 uh, of uh, liquid uh, tumors, as, they were, as it were. It works through ADCC action. ADCC requires NK cells. And so the question was, uh, can we m model that and, and therefore look at this problem of, of, of killing of CD20 uh, tumors? And that works actually pretty nice. Uh, uh, we used a model uh, cell line. In this case, Raji treated the mouse with rituximab, and we used either the the 15 mouse or the other mouse. And if you look at this result, you can see that if you treat an SRG15 mouse, which has received uh, the, the uh, B cell uh, uh, lymphoma, uh, with rituximab, you can clear it. This requires the presence of, of, uh, of both the drug, as you can see here, and the, and, and the mouse. Uh, all these other combinations don't work. So it's a very, very simple model system, but one which kind of gives a proof of principle that this, this could be useful for, for that kind of studies. So to summarize, that system, just putting these few genes together is useful. And uh, what, as I said, we've now done is create a mouse, which is a Mr. G15, so we can study it in a bit more physiologic uh, context. But let's get to, get to solid tumors. And uh, we've been collaborating for quite a long time now with Carolina Paluca and, and her uh, postdoc, Jan Martinek. 
And uh, what we basically did in the first set of studies was to engraft Mr. G mice, the, the, the first version, what the kind of model one, if as it were, with human melanoma. Th these were human melanoma lines that were made from, from tumors that came into their, their system. And um, these mice, we, we then engrafted NSGs versus Mr. G. To ask this question, really, do these human myeloid cells get into the tumor? Do they do anything? And how do, if they do, how does it work? Now, you all know that, that uh, macrophages are, are, are known for supporting tumor growth and, and mouse systems, very good data showing that they will also uh, mediate um, metastasis. Um, CD163 macrophages are detectable. This is actually a human melanoma uh, sample from, from, from them. And then, so we compared the, the infiltration of the human melanoma in an engrafted Mr. G mouse. And so the, in this case, the mouse gets the human immune system, but then it gets the tumor as well. And if you look at the, you count the, the, the cell numbers, there's, a, there's a, you know, much more obviously than the control uh, NSG, but uh, maybe not as many as, as is seen here. Perhaps that has to do with other lineage we lack, but certainly there's something. And it allows us to ask the question, is it doing something of importance in the development of the tumor? And that takes us all to the, the M1, M2 paradigm. Which I know it's a, it's a uh, cliche, but uh, the basic issue in, in, in tumor biology, of course, is cells of this character, M2 character, support tumor vascularization and have a, an anti-inflammatory tissue repair function. And so if you look at, the, at, the, at human patients and if you look at Mr. G, these both have this property of these uh, CD206 positive M2-like macrophages. Uh, and as, as many of you will know, the property that is thought to come from those cells is the ability to make it VEGF. <coughs> VEGF is a target, obviously, of uh, tumor therapy through, um, through Avastin-like uh, or, or other related drugs. Uh, if you look at the vascularization of the tumors in Mr. G compared to an NSG, they're obviously more vascularized, which was also consistent with this. And actually, if you look at uh, the tumor growth in this environment, it's very clear that, that if you put a, uh, these hu human melanomas into Mr. G, uh, they grow much faster than they do in, a, in, in an NSG. These are engrafted mice, but this is a property of the immune cells. If you just put them into the mice without the human immune system, there's no difference. And that was all very obvious if you compare here. This is the, the Mr. G engrafted with the, 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 uh, the tumor. And indeed, this is a vascularization phenotype because if you treat them with a vastin, then you just bring them back down to the control level. So that very simple experiment kind of validates that, that simple idea that at least one of the things that these myeloid cells are doing is to provide vascular uh, biology. So that summarizes that. We could, at least some of the properties of these tumors, we could, uh, we could uh, recapitulate. The second property, that, that, uh, that, and I should mention the person that did uh, the lion's share of this work, Anthony Ronvo, uh, uh, just a fantastic uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow. He now has his own lab at the Hutch, and he's continuing this work, which, which this is work he did before he left, and where he showed that actually the uh, engrafted mice also uh, show more metastases uh, for these systems, and that, that's what he's studying in the future. But already in this preliminary experiment, you can see this, this result. So. That's a, a very interesting mechanism to look into. But all of us here in the, uh, are interested not in these, uh, these, these uh, rather heterologous systems, because remember what I did, and I probably didn't explain that, is I'm giving a tumor cell line uh, and combining that with a, 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 an allogeneic, meaning from another donor, source of hematopoietic cells, in this case from fetal liver, because they're very good cells to engraft uh, an immune system. But where we want to get to is patient-derived cells and the patient's own tumor so that we can do autologous experiments and actually model <coughs> what, uh, we, what might be going on in the patient. And if you can imagine we could do that, then we may be able to contribute to the, to the portfolio of how a patient could be treated. And so this is the pipeline that we use. We basically recover uh, hematopoietic cells from, from either mobilized peripheral blood or from the, the bone marrow from a consented patient, inject that into, hepatically into these Mr. G uh, pups. Now we're using this, this model, I'll explain in just a second, Mr. G6, uh, and that gives us the in vivo reconstitution, and then once we have that working, we 
put in an autologous uh, P uh, PDX uh, uh, transplant uh, by providing a cell suspension and then analyze the tumor after four to six weeks. Um, so we, we, we're doing this in, in three contexts, actually. Uh, uh, Michael Curazzi in the lab, who, who's a member of, of the Cancer Center and, and, and a, an oncologist, uh, is working on non-small cell uh, lung cancer. We're doing the melanoma study still, together with Carolina at the JAXS and, uh, and Jan. Uh, and we have established a very productive c collaboration with Ryan Fields, who's at Wash U, where we're looking at both melanoma and pancreatic cases. And this is where I should introduce the, the kind of model number two, the, the, the improved Mr. Gene. This is where we've added a, a gene which expresses human IL-6. And what that does is it makes the efficiency of hematopoiesis substantially better. And I know it's a little hard to see, but if you compare uh, adult bone marrow, this is, this is a, a, now a Mr. G here, uh, uh, and this is Mr. G6, this is NSG. So NSG to Mr. G's uh, better, but G6 is considerably better with, than Mr. G. And this is worked by Yunjiang Jing in, in the lab. Uh, and so this is what the system we, we now use. And um, we've uh, done s several uh, autologous experiments. This is, of course, very much a work in progress between, between Michael and Jan and Carolina. In this particular case, these are uh, tumor. This, this is now engrafting uh, uh, CD34 cells that were obtained from melanoma patients. Uh, we can engraft reasonably well in these cases. This is the details for, for those that are interested. And anybody needs this information, of course. We're happy to provide it. Um, and interestingly, we're finding that, that we recapitulate what we saw with this, auto, with this uh, heterologous, I mean, in other words, allogeneic transplantation, where you, where you see that the tumor growth uh, in an engrafted mouse tends to be stronger than it is in um, a, a non-engrafted mouse. In other words, what we saw in the case of those previous studies suggests that, that it, it's recapitulated using really autologous patient immune cells and patient tumor. And that's, these are three patient examples. And uh, some spontaneous metastases has also been observed, and so we're, we're now quantitating and, and uh, taking a look at this to, to get a good sense of what's going on, in particular uh, doing a variety of single cell experiments as we move through this. Um, and uh, you can see that the human immune cells are infiltrating the autologous tumors. That this is showing some fields here uh, uh, where red is CD45. These are, these are the immune cells. And so, I, again, you can imagine, uh, bearing in mind this is, this is uh, preliminary data, that one can study these, these things and get a sense of what's going on, which could lead, of course, to the study of therapy. And so we've done some uh, early uh, studies using, uh, using uh, uh, checkpoint inhibition and, uh, again, uh, uh, angiogenesis uh, inhibitors, and you see taking the, the, the engrafted patient uh, 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 immune system from patient three here, obviously de-identified, um, that, that this, here's the controlled tumor growing in an engrafted mouse but treated with anti-PD-1, that, that we, have, we have statistically significant control. Uh, here you can see some, some data in unengrafted and grafted. That's, that's one of these examples, and this is actually uh, 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 repeating the result with, with the uh, anti-VEGF. So um, Michael has, has got a whole a program of collecting uh, non-small cell lung cancer here at Yale, uh, using these materials to make patient-derived patient xenograft lines. This is an important thing because, of course, one can't, it's difficult to do quantitative experimentation w unless we have a, a reliable source of material. So, so Bone marrow aspirates are, are, are taken at surgery, xenograft lines are, in, are generated, and then they're put together in the system. And here's his pipeline for doing this, uh, as you can see here. And I won't go through the details of that, but I think you've got a sense of how, how this is being done. Ultimately, of course, what we want to be doing is to, to, to be looking at the tumor, the, um, the immune background, particularly all the developing immune cells, but also to recover uh, uh, either peripheral blood cells or, or, or tumor infiltrating cells to look at the interactions between all these systems. And here's, here's a kind of a, 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 a progress report. These are consented patients and the samples that were obtained def defining the CD34 cells. So he's been able to get good numbers of cells uh, 
uh, from a variety of different tumors. And these are the cases where he was able to establish PDXs to use for this. And here's, uh, here's some data from this, early data on this, on, on this non-small cell uh, study. Here, in actually, one case, this is just a pilot, but it looks like the engraftment in this case doesn't infect, uh, affect growth. And we'll, we'll have to go looking into that and seeing whether this is a real uh, phenomenon. So um, now, in the case of the work with, with Ryan, and this is a three-way collaboration uh, with Ryan, Carolina, and our lab. So we have all three labs involved. Now the question is, uh, what we're looking at is the genomic and neoantigen studies. Remember that, uh, that, that um, um, the Wash, uh, Wash U group has been pioneers, really, in the study of neoantigens in cancer. And so we're combining now uh, RNA and DNA sequencing uh, with the Mr. G system. And you can see three examples of PDXs which were, which were obtained. And in this case, actually, you're seeing, again, a recapitulation of the effect of engraftment, giving, in general, a better growth. And uh, this is an early experiment where, where, where um, we, we looked at, at uh, exon sequencing. And you can see that, that most of the mutations actually in, that were in the original metastases. In this case, it was a metastatic uh, a met that was taken, uh, made into a PDX. And so 200 and something of the mutations were, were, were shown to be uh, still maintained. But a few uh, uh, mutations seem to have, at least in this preliminary result, seems, seem to be modified by engraftment, suggesting that we could be having editing of the tumor. And of course, this is totally preliminary, but you can see that we, by going into this in more detail, we can probably get a sense of what those things are, what the the potential new epitopes might be, and, and so on and so on. And so this takes me to the end. Um, what, this is, of course, a work in progress. It's always, it has been now for, for 30, uh, 13 years. Um, we, it tends to go stepwise. We, got, we were getting the things going. Then we got this Mr. G system. And then we've moved beyond that to get this, uh, this uh, uh, Mr. G6 system. We, we really are hoping to use this to, to learn something useful to the cancer community and to help uh, ultimately help the clinicians uh, decide for any given individual what would be the best uh, course of action. And so this is the, where we are now, patient-specific mice. Um, we've, one of the original problems with the model was short lifespan, and we think we figured out how to improve that, which will make it possible to do more, more, more invasive kind of experimentation. So let's finish up. This, this is Michael. I forced him to get me a photograph yesterday. And uh, he's uh, doing a fantastic job. Uh, he's, uh, he's working here, right here and, and, and with all these, these systems I described to you. And uh, it's still been a, been a, a fantastic team over the years. Uh, particularly, again, what I mentioned Anthony, because I didn't actually show his picture. But uh, Anthony was just an incredible contributor. And, he is going to be, really make a difference over there at the Hutch. He's, he's already doing great work, and I'm very, very happy he's doing so well. Dietmar and Liang uh, were involved with the, um, the NK system. Uh, Yun Zhang uh, has done a really beautiful job of, of setting up these systems, and she actually is developing a system where we believe we are now finally getting um, uh, neutrophils, which would be very helpful. I mentioned the, the JAX group and Carolina and Jan, Ryan and Brad, uh, and uh, many, many people in the lab and also beyond the lab at, at Yale, uh, like Katie and her colleagues and so on. And then finally, uh, sources of uh, support, Stand Up to Cancer had a, uh, a support, Reg Regeneron uh, not only helped us, but of course they supported the meeting today, so that's also very good. Uh, the Gates Foundation got us, uh, supported us for around 10 odd years developing this system just on this area, and so that's been tremendously helpful. And also, obviously, the Cancer Center. Thank you very much.